section of a um, 45 minute presentation I did at Electronic Resources and Libraries in Austin, just as COVID was descending upon us. So I'm hoping I'm kind of bookending it here. So I was giving this presentation as it came in our front door and hopefully I'm giving a condensed version of this as we're kicking it out the back door and, and to see it never more. That's, that's my hope at least. All right, uh, yeah, um, I'm bringing, them up, bringing up the slides. It's just taking a second, Tim, sorry. That's fine. That's fine. And so this presentation is about um, myths relating to big deals um, because there's a certain conception and picture of big deals that people have in their minds. Um, you know, when they hear the word or the term big deal, they have a certain understanding of what that encompasses. And so uh, to begin with, I'd like to challenge you guys to think of a couple of words to that to you describe big deals. Big deals are, and then fill that in with a, a couple of adjectives there, uh, the kind of things that, that you think of when you think of big deals. Um, <clears throat> so within the Carolina Consortium, I'm talking about this within the Carolina Consortium context because it's, uh, a broader scope and gives us a broader view of uh, big deals than uh, just looking at the ones that UNCG is in because we're you know one institution of a certain size and when you look across a whole group like the Carolina Consortium which has you know many 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 different types of libraries of uh, greatly divergent sizes uh, we have uh, within the CC uh, member institutions in big deals that are like uh, you know Chapel Hill, despite what they say about being out of big deals, are in Carolina Consortium big deals, uh, all the way down to uh, a high school, North Carolina School of Science and Math. Um, we have community colleges in big deals. We have a chiropractic college in big deals. Uh, so we're kind of all over the place. All right, so two more slides, I believe, Anna, if you would. Okay, and so big deals are uh, one more, and we'll get to the little word art that shows um, the, it's a representation of big deals that uh, are available to the Carolina Consortium. And it's kind of minimalist at the moment, but it uh, shows it's keyed to uh, the larger the font, the, the larger the number of schools within a given big deal. So there's, so you can see there's more in Wiley and Marianne Liebert and Sage and fewer in Nature and UC Press, but you see that we have quite a few publishers that we work with. All right, so let's go to the next slide and we'll start getting into some of the myths. So one of the words that people most frequently use to describe a big deal is unsurprisingly big. That's right, it's two words, big deal. So half of that is big. So they've all gotta be big, right? Well, that's not actually the case. So of our 21 big deals that we have in the Carolina Consortium, only three have over a thousand titles, and that's Wiley, Springer, and Elsevier. And in fact, we've got uh, 13 with less than 100. So we have more big deals with less than 100 than we have big deals with more than 100 titles. So we have big deals, everything that you get from a particular publisher with UC Press, Duke University Press, Carger, Marianne Liebert, Tima, there's a whole bunch of small publishers that we get everything they publish. So we're in big deals with them. So big deals can be big and there are big, you know, large packages like Elsevier, but most of the ones that Carolina Consortium offers are actually small and less than a hundred. So that's kind of a myth that all big deals are big. Next myth, please. Okay, the big deals are expensive, that they cost a mint and, you know, you go broke trying to even afford one. Um, at the bottom of this chart here, you can see there is one school that was paying more than $2 million for a big deal. And they're actually dropped out of that deal. So they're not paying that anymore. Um, and if you look at the top, uh, there are nearly 120 schools or 120 deals that cost less than $10,000 each. So we have about 280 total big deal subscriptions within the Carolina Consortium. And as you can see, most of them cost less than 10,000. So it's just not true that all these big deals are these huge multi-million dollar deals. In fact, we've only got one or only had one 
out of 280 that was. But yet that's the way they're so often characterized, uh, typically by people who are opposed to big deals and want to do something different, right? Because it's you want to paint something in the worst possible light if you want to change it. So if you want to change big deals and say they're bad, you want to say they're all super expensive. But that's just not the reality and not, not the truth. Next myth. All right, so the next myth is that you know, if you <clears throat> do business with one of these publishers, they're going to put you in this little you know, big deal jail right? that you can't escape from. And you're going to be trapped in this multi-year, you know, multi, multiple years in this tiny cell, this Elsevier cell or whatever that you can't leave. Um, and you have no choice. You can't leave. There's no options. You're stuck in this one cell. And that's it. And that's just not true and was never true. So you do not have to do multi-year deals with publishers to do a big deal. They will do a shorter deal with you if you want. Um, it's usually more expensive, which is why people choose to do longer deals. It, it works out at a lower cost per year. If you're in a multi-year deal with a publisher, uh, as we are with uh, Wiley, Sage, Elsevier, Springer, several, if we want to leave early, we can. We can just walk out. There's no locked jail cell here. We can just leave if we want to. All right. And that's the way the CC big deals work. And the idea that you have to get all of the journals, that these publishers are forcing you to get this package of all the journals, that's not true. If you wanted to get only three Elsevier journals, you could subscribe to three Elsevier journals instead of being in a big deal. That's fine. They will let you do that that the big deal is kind of a take it or leave it option, that you have this one choice. If you wanna do a big deal with Elsevier, they will give you one choice and you do it their way or you don't do it at all. That's not true. We had four choices from Elsevier. We had three choices from Wiley. We had four choices from Springer. We have many choices, but there are many options on the table. There are different iterations of these big deals and we can shape them uh, with the publisher to best meet our needs. And the Carolina Consortium was able to offer multiple options to schools and say each school can choose the version of the big deal that works best for them. So it's not you have to do this certain Wiley deal a certain way. There's no choice. That's It's just not the way big deals are. And also that the publisher you know, by locking you in this jail cell with the commercial presses is, you know, being anti-OA and if you do big deals, you hate open access and don't support that. And again, that's not true, big deals. You know, big deals do tend to involve paywalls, all right? So that conceptually is anti-open access, but they are increasingly adding open access components, um, primarily in the form of read and publish deals, but also with APC credits, which Anna is gonna talk about both those things in, in just a few minutes. But overall, you're not trapped in some cell and you know by a big deal. There are options, there are opportunities to leave and you do have choice in the matter. Next myth, please, is that if you listen to the news about big deals, uh, the impression that you get is that big deals are just falling apart and that libraries are leaving in droves. They finally come to their senses and realize what a crappy deals they are. They're too expensive. They just don't get the use. The prices are going through the roof. They're just not worth it. Well, the problem with that is it doesn't seem to be true based on the data that I see. And the reason people have that impression is that the big schools that leave big deals talk about how big their price tags are and they want to make a big deal about their departure, right? So they're doing press releases. The UC system leaves the Elsevier deal, right? So that was a huge news in the world library community. Now, when, when the UC system rejoined the Elsevier deal a year and a half later, it was much smaller news. It's big news and it's trumpeted from the rooftops when somebody leaves, but when somebody joins, there's really not much said about it. And if you look at a site like the Spark website, they have a list of everybody who left big deals, but they don't have a list of people who joined big deals, which is a super terrible methodology, right? If you, if you gave somebody an impression of your bank account and only showed the withdrawals and not the deposits, 
they would have a very negative impression of your finances, but it's not a balanced impression because it doesn't include the ads and the drops. And when you look at the ads and the drops across our consortium, it's true that we are down from our peak of 300 uh, big deal uh, big deals that we had in 2009, but we're at 280. There hasn't been a huge decline, and there was a huge increase from 04 to 09. And the overall trend line uh, over uh, the 15 years since we started doing big deals is going upwards, not downwards. But we have had people leave, as you'll see on the next slide. So 2019 is the most recent non-COVID impacted years and the COVID years have been a little weird. I'm still trying to work out how to make that data tell a better story that makes more sense because it's all anomalous data, of course. But in 2019, that last pre-COVID year, we had uh, what, eight, nine, 10, 11 ads and seven drops, right? So we had a net ad of four. So again, if you look at like the Spark website, you know, they would say, oh my God, six people are leaving these, or seven people are leaving Carolina Consortium, big deals. That shows that everybody's leaving uh, all the big deals. Um, but without seeing the ads, you don't get that balanced picture. So, and hardly anyone does data this way. Hardly anyone actually shows the ads and the drops. I mean, the, the thing about big deals is, you know, the, the folks who like to talk about them like to be negative, so they like to only show the negative data. So it's hard to get this kind of balanced perspective on things. Next slide. Okay, and then of course, um, the myth that you know big deals are all incredibly incredible ripoffs, right? The publishers are just taking your money and you know, laughing in your face because you know your authors are writing the articles and they're making these ridiculous profits and you know Elsevier has a 37 percent profit margin and that's unconscionable and they have big deals so that proves that big deals are expensive and ripoffs well it doesn't do anything like that that's ridiculous so <laughs> Elsevier is a huge multinational with lots of businesses they don't make 37 percent off their big deals they make it off all their stuff right and if you don't have a big deal with them you still subscribe to their journals so you're still paying them. I mean, it's almost like saying, I'm mad at Harris Teeter, they're a big ripoff, so I'm not gonna buy their chicken anymore. Now I'm only gonna buy you know, pork from them. Well, it's not gonna make any difference. I'm just buying something else from them. That doesn't really affect their profit margin. So yeah, they have one product that you don't like and they make a lot of money, but you can't equate those two things. So that's just Elsevier, but keep in mind, a lot of our um, big deals are with nonprofits. I mean, it's, Cambridge isn't making a profit off of this because they're a nonprofit. Oxford isn't, Duke isn't, UC Press isn't. And it's not just the university presses, you know, annual reviews is a big deal that we're in and they're a nonprofit as well. So it's just not true that big deals writ large, you know, there's this huge profit margin. And in fact, they are a good mechanism for cost containment. The issue that a lot of people worry about the most with big deals is inflation. But the inflation rate for big deals is lower, lower than direct subscriptions, which is the alternative. If you're not in a big deal, you have direct subscriptions and the inflation rate is higher. So you're paying the publisher more. So this idea that they're all ripoffs is definitely a myth. Next slide. So, you know, overall, the conception that people who tend to talk about big deals a lot uh, in the media and in conferences and things is that there are all these huge, really expensive deals that have super high profit margins, the uh, totally unsustainable cost increases every year. You're forced in these multi-year deals that you can't get out of. You're only given one choice. And because all these things are true, for all big deals that they're bad for libraries and the libraries are suddenly realizing this and they're all leaving. So the thing is that, you know, there are some big deals that are big and expensive. There are some that are multi-year. I Maybe there are some that don't give you the choice to exit. Um, there aren't any in my consortium. Um, there are some with high profit margins. There are some that are inflexible. Um, and 
they are those ones are bad for libraries. So there are there are deals like that, but that doesn't mean they're all that way, right? And that's the problem I have is that big deals tend to get painted with this really broad brush. Um, next slide. And of course, I could do the same thing the other way. I could cherry pick the data and say, you know, these things are true of big deals, and they are. You know, that big deals cost less than a thousand dollars a year because I have schools in the Carolina Consortium paying less than a thousand dollars a year. That big deals have zero percent inflation for an entire decade, which is true. I have a big deal like that. Um, that the biggest, baddest, most expensive publisher that everybody says is a ridiculous ripoff. I have a school getting their articles for 27 cents an article, which is true. And it's ridiculously cheap. It's super good. That there's a big deal that the cost literally went down by 50% permanently a few years ago. And so all these things are true and that, and that all our faculty articles are automatically made open access in our, our big deals. So all those things are true, but all those things aren't true of all big deals, right? That's cherry picking the data in the opposite direction and saying that, you know, the really good terms apply to everybody, which isn't true. So the reality is of course, much more nuanced. And I think this is my last slide, the next one. And that's that big deals are really diverse and complicated. And it's it helps us understand our environment to oversimplify things, of course, you know, to kind of stereotype big deals a certain way because you get your mind wrapped around a single concept that everything's a certain way better than you can to understand the diversity and that things are very different. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of folks in library leadership positions that have kind of bought into that narrative that big deals are all the same and that they all fit this very negative stereotype. The reality is not is that big deals aren't bad and they aren't good. They're really bad for some libraries. I've seen libraries paying you know, $200 an article and really bad cost escalations. And again, I've seen libraries paying you know 15 cents an article and have no cost increases. It really depends on the library. But across all big deals, there's a very strong trend for improvement. Everything, the, the inflation rates are coming down, the costs are, are being contained or being reduced. We're having more choice. We're having more open access parts. Um, and it's just becoming a better deal overall. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that big deals will be sustainable over time. Just because something's getting better doesn't mean you can keep doing it forever, right? It has to get better at a certain rate in order for you to be able to continue to afford it. So the big deals will continue to change and whether they will still be around in the current form a few years from now is hard to predict, uh, but they're definitely getting better. Um, one of the reasons they're getting better is because of the uh, addition of greater open access, uh, mainly through these read and publish deals, which is what Anna's going to talk about now. Any questions for me before I hand it over? All right. Well, if questions come up, uh, feel free to enter them in the chat and we can address them. Thanks, Tim. It's great to hear about the big deals with some nuance and not just the, um, the myths. So um, I was going to turn my camera on, but my computer is really being slow this afternoon, so I think I'm going to leave it off. So we're going to talk about read publish deals. Um, these are new and developing publication models. You may sometimes hear them referred to as transformative deals. And in these deals, we're paying for content. This is the model that we're all familiar with. It's what libraries have done for decades and decades. We're paying for content that we read. This is the read piece of read publish. And these publishers are incentivizing our researchers to publish with them because of these payments that we're making for that read content. So this publication incentive piece is the publish piece. So there are two parts with this. There's some deals that we still have that are very much that all read model, but more, uh, more and more, we're trying out some of these newer read publish ones. So because, uh, or while we're paying to read this content, 
we're paying for subscription content. That content is generally not open access. So that's not an OA component of this. But the publish aspect of these deals usually focuses on open content. So because these deals are supporting open access publishing, they're not just benefiting us and our researchers here at UNCG, they're benefiting everybody. They're making that scholarship available to all. And these are the current read published deals uh, that we have with different companies. So we've got Cambridge University Press, Wiley, Sage, IGI Global, and MDPI. And the Cambridge one is an awesome deal. So with them, all articles that are published by corresponding authors at UNCG are eligible for open publishing with no APCs. And so there's some terminology and, and jargon going on here. A corresponding author is the one that submits the paper. And an APC is an article processing charge. And this is common with open access publishing where instead of uh, the article being subscription-based where the university or the library, whoever is paying to subscribe or an individual might be paying to subscribe, the author is paying an article processing charge to make that content available openly. So it's a different model. And here the APCs are being waived. And this started last year in January. And um, there are no APCs for our, our authors and there are no limits. This is open to everyone at UNCG who is publishing with Cambridge. So it's really ideal for our researchers who want to publish open access, but don't have funding for APCs. And there's a link here to a list of Cambridge journals that authors can consider as potential publication venues. And that includes both hybrid and gold open journals. The difference there is that a gold journal is one where all of the content is open access. A hybrid journal is where most of the content is, uh, or where the content is subscription by default, but you might pay an APC to make yours open. And in this case, our authors can publish for free in either of them. Cambridge does have a small list of journals that don't have any OA access, and these are excluded. If you want details on that, then let me know. They are trying to move more of their journals to this model that supports open, so that list is uh, shrinking over time. So they publish more than 380 peer-reviewed academic journals. They cover the humanities, social sciences, and STEM fields. And uh, the link here goes to their list of journals. And this is slowing down a little bit, sorry. Got a little bit ahead. Sorry, y'all. I'm I'm not sure what's going on with technology today. Okay, so Cambridge, how does this work? So it, we have tried to make it pretty easy. Uh, their online system should recognize the email address of corresponding authors. So you've got that UNCG email address that ends in at uncg.edu. You submit your paper using that email address and the system should recognize you. And then it should give you that option to select free open publication of your work. And with all of these journals and all of these deals, it doesn't mean that you automatically can be published in any journal that you want. You still have to go through that same peer review process and acceptance. So it's not an automatic, I can publish with any of these publishers or journals. You still have those processes that you would go through. Okay, so our next deal is Wiley. This one is brand new, and this is through the Carolina Consortium. So Tim and his colleagues have gotten this into place for us very recently. It started in January, and through this deal, we have access to a pool of 700 APC vouchers to publish in Wiley's journals. So this started just over a month ago, and we already have UNCG authors and authors around the, Car the Carolina Consortium who are using these vouchers. It's pretty exciting to get to see those numbers go up. So this is open again to anyone at UNCG. That UNCG email address piece is required again, as well as other researchers who are at participating Carolina Consortium institutions. And like Cambridge, it's really ideal for researchers who want to publish open, but don't have APC funding. And this deal, unlike Cambridge, only includes hybrid journals. So those subscription-based journals that 
or closed based journals that uh, traditionally you would be paying an APC to turn your article open. Uh, but the vast majority of Wiley's journals are hybrid. So it's really, uh, they've got 1600 journals and more than 1400 of them offer hybrid OA. So we're getting a great deal in terms of the availability of those journals. And there's a link here that will take you to more information about this, as well as a list that you can download for all of the journals that include hybrid OA. Like Cambridge, they've got an online system that should recognize the corresponding author's email address, and then you should have the option to select free open publication of your work. So we've got 700 vouchers, and these are not just for UNCG, these are 700 across the participating institutions. And this is the first year that we're doing this. So we're starting to get an idea of how, uh, how they're being used, but we don't have a lot of data yet. So we don't really know uh, when these might be exhausted. If we run out of these vouchers before the end of the year, then we will instead have a 10% discount on APC costs instead of being able to offer that fully funded article processing charge. So as things move forward this year, we will find out more about um, what to expect in terms of that. With SAGE, we've got a 10% discount on APCs for all UNCG authors who are publishing in SAGE's uh, suite of gold OA journals. And there's a link here that will take you to the list of those journals that SAGE offers. So this, this deal is not as good as uh, Cambridge or Wiley, but it still is a discount. So they offer more than 150 fully open journals. Those are their gold journals. They're primarily social and behavioral science fields, but they do have coverage in some other areas as well. And the list of their journals is here. Um, oh, and Leah has a question. Tim, this might be one for you. I don't know the answer. Will the Wiley APC vouchers roll over to the next year if not used? Uh, unfortunately not. Okay, good to know. Um, but it seems like we are probably on track to use them, given the short, uh, short amount of time that we've had them so far. I think, I think we're slightly behind, actually. So we, we haven't run through, we didn't run through a 12th of them in the first month, I'll put it that way. Okay. But I mean, we probably ran through a 15th of them or a 20th of them. So we're not too far behind. Yeah, yeah, and we're just you know starting to get the word out, so people are finding out about them, um, and we'll we'll have to see over the course of the year how that use uh, grows and where we are as we get closer to the end of the year. Yeah, thanks, Leah. All right, so how does this work with Sage? They have a similar system, although you need to email them. So when you're asked to arrange the payment of the APC, this is the information that you send to SAGE and you have to let them know that you're eligible for this Carolina Consortium 10% discount with them. We also have a deal with IGI Global. And again, with them, we have APC credits that can be used not just for open access articles, but for book chapters. And they publish in a lot of areas. You can see them here on this slide. And when you submit your manuscript to them, again, you need to use your UNCG email address. And at that starting uh, submission stage, you would be selecting an option of traditional or OA publishing and select OA. And they've got a flyer that's linked here that provides more details. MDPI is a little bit different. Uh, like SAGE, they have a 10% discount on APCs for UNCG authors. This 10% discount also applies to BPCs. These are book processing charges. And they publish, like IGI, in a lot of different areas. And again, like, like IGI, when you submit your paper, you need to select that discount and use your UNCG email address so that they can confirm your institutional affiliation. And this one isn't technically a read publish deal. MDPI is an all OA publisher. They don't have anything for us to subscribe to. So there's, we're not paying to read, um, but we are getting an incentive from them on the published piece. So it's included here because it has the same impact on UNCG authors as the other read publish deals. And they don't really need to know um, that it's not truly the same kind of deal. 
I will say about MDPI that they have a lot of journals and they are of varying levels of quality and impact. So they have some uh, some journals that are, are kind of renowned in their specific areas, but then they have some that are perhaps less, uh, less good. Um, so with all journals that are unfamiliar to you, definitely consider them carefully before you submit your work. And if you have questions about that, ask a librarian. You can always ask me. And I see another question in the chat. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have some qualms about some of MDPI's journals too, Leah. It's, uh, they have some that are very important in certain subject areas. And I have, um, I've looked at the other schools that are in this particular uh, group that's getting this deal and they're, you know, big schools. And I've talked to some other librarians about this. Um, so I, you know, the, the research that I have done has said, you know, this is, this is helpful to some of our authors. So it's, it, it has a positive impact, but we also need to definitely be careful about what journals we are selecting. But we need to be careful about that all the time. All right. So is one of these journals or publishers right for you? Liaison librarians are a great place to start with that question. So I've got the link to the library liaisons here. And the liaisons, of course, are assigned to the subject areas and can help authors find journals that might meet their needs. And a few reminders here. If you want to make sure you've got the latest information or if you've got any questions about the status of do we have vouchers left, what's going on with a particular deal, um, the info is on the LibGuide here or that's linked to the Go link, or you can ask me. So definitely reach out if you or your faculty members or other authors have questions. Um, so then what if your target journal or publisher is not included in one of these deals? What do we do then? Um, happily, we do have some other support for publishing openly, and Christine is going to talk about that. Hello, I'm going to share information about the Open Access Publishing Fund that's supported jointly by the uh, Office of Research and Engagement and the University Libraries. It was established back in 20. Um, 11, 2012 in that academic year. And there were five uh, grants awarded at that point. Uh, so far this academic year, we've uh, approved 30 applications. The link that was on the, on the page uh, right before uh, gives you access to, direct access to the OAPF page that is on Anna's scholarly communications libguide. Next slide. Uh, this fund supports the article processing charges required to publish in many of the open access journals that we um, are familiar with, and it can it can cost several thousand dollars. Uh, full time faculty and full time EHRA employees, as well as enrolled graduate students can uh, apply for up to $1,500 in an academic year for an article. And we also have had a few applications for OA book chapters. Next slide. Uh, those applying learn about this opportunity from library liaisons through webinars offered by Anna and others and through colleagues in their departments who participated over the years. Uh, applications are reviewed by a small team that is um, Amy Fatih, who's an LIS and me. One of the key requirements is that the journal appears in doaj.org, which is the directory of open access journals. And that group independently researches OA journals to be sure they meet certain criteria. And as Anna alluded to, there, there are some predatory open access journals and we don't want those publishers taking advantage of our researchers. So you, you see it listed in, and, um, in, in the DOAJ and um, you'd know whether you know an MDPI, MDPI um, publication is, is one that they consider uh, reliable uh, based on what we were just talking about here a minute ago. So far, um, we've had researchers published in various journals from publishers and those publishers that include MDPI, Frontiers Media, Elsevier, Sage, and Wiley. And the departments that um, that participate, folks are from all across the campus, but the you know the especially active departments are biology, nanoscience, nutrition, and kinesiology. 
Uh, Robin and I work together as she coordinates reimbursements with business officers and departments, and we keep Mike informed about expenditures. We have not had to decline any applications due to lack of funds as we near the end of the year, but we just keep an eye on it because you just never know. Uh, next slide. As Anna described, some of our publishing partners offer discounts that are applied to APCs. So the applicant of, uh, for the OAPF takes advantage of those discounts, then they can seek funds through our process. And a researcher could get that 10% discount from SAGE, then use $1,500 uh, from, the, um, from the fund. And then if there's any remaining cost, then that is perhaps taken from their um, own uh, you know, personal money. So it, it, this uh, $1,500 is just really crucial for giving people the opportunity to publish. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. All right, y'all. So if you have questions about this stuff now or in the future, or if you're trying to help a researcher with these things, the liaison librarians are a great place to start with many questions. They have that subject expertise piece that can help authors identify the venues where they might want to publish and um, answer questions about what some of their options might be. If you've got questions about open access and OA publishing support in general and predatory journals and other Scalcom stuff, you of course are welcome to contact me. Christine leads that group that she mentioned that reviews the open access publishing fund applications. And she also manages with Robin the logistics of transferring those funds. And of course, Tim and the Carolina Consortium team negotiate these deals with publishers. And Tim, as I was going through this, I realized that some of these deals I know are through the Carolina Consortium and I'm not sure about others. So like SAGE and IGI, are those UNCG deals or are they through the CC? Uh, those two are Carolina Consortium deals. I think the only one that has an OA component that isn't a CC deal is MDPI. Yeah. Yeah, I the, think that's The right. CC has at least one OA deal that UNCG is not in, and that's Carger. Uh, which is a small nursing and health science publisher. And we were in an OA deal with them. UNCG participated in that, but we had to drop it when we had the budget cuts a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks. Um, so we've got the link, the go link to the slides, and I've also got the link to the read publish guide, which is part of the Scalcom lib guide. Um, have y'all got any questions? For the liaisons here, I know some of y'all have um, have reached out when questions have come up about these things. Are y'all seeing um, in any increased interest in OA publishing from your liaison areas that you might be able to share or no change or? Oh, Leah says, heck yes, yay, that's great. Glad to hear that. I've seen an increase in um predatory journals in my yeah. area. Um, but maybe I'm noticing it more. <laughs> maybe it was always there, but it seems like they've gotten worse in the pandemic. But again, maybe that's a perception. I don't have data to back that up. Yeah, I, I have a similar perception of, um, of that. But again, I don't have data on it other than my own experience and questions from researchers. I've had, it seems like more of the researchers who in my areas who contact me for advice on finding a place to publish, it feels like they're having a hard time finding a non-fee based option. There were, for instance, I've had some people contact me and say, hey, we're really interested in this journal. Can you take a look? And maybe that journal only offers the maybe the OA, but there's an APC. So there's not a, you know, there's not a traditional option, and maybe the fee is like super high. And this isn't something that happens over and over, but I'm I worry a little bit about our researchers. I'm glad there's so much interest in OA publishing. 
among our researchers, but I feel like also the choices available to them may be changing a little. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's good to hear about in terms of being aware of what's going on out there. I, uh, I don't know um, how prevalent like OA only would be versus traditional or subscription based options. And some of it may be kind of discipline specific, but when a, when say you're in like an, a very niche area and you like the best journal or the really only journal that you want to publish in is like only a gold journal that requires APCs, then that can make it very hard if you don't have funding or if, you, um, if you've if you already like applied to the OAPF or something like that and you don't can't, um, can't apply for funding again within that year. Yeah, I think it's kind of unintended consequences. Again, I think a lot of, it kind of goes back to that myth of the big deal that because so many library leaders hated the big deal, old big deal model so much, they demanded that there be more open access models, but somebody's still got to pay for it. It's not like they become free. You're just changing it from the cost from the subscri subscribers and shifting that onto the authors. And because a lot of library leaders said, that's what we want to do, more gold OA journals popped up. So there are more journals that you've got to pay to publish. Uh, so the cost has shifted onto the authors and sometimes there are OA publishing funds like we have and sometimes there aren't. And then there are deals like the, our Wiley deal, which only covers the hybrids. So the hybrids are the ones where you have a choice of publishing and having your article appear behind the paywall. Okay, so there's, you don't have to pay an APC or you can pay an APC, that's a choice. And we have, and, and for those, our vouchers can pay for that for you. But for the Wiley Gold uh, OA journals, and there's not that many of them, if you get accepted to publish in those, you still have to pay. And we can't use a voucher for those. The vouchers are only good for the hybrids. So, I mean, I think libraries kind of unintentionally created more requirements to pay APCs uh, in our zeal to promote OA, which is a good thing but it did have some unintended uh, side effects that affect our faculty. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And one thing for colleagues who, uh, or for librarians who are working with authors who are looking for funding and, and maybe struggling, definitely ask if they have co-authors at other schools that may have funding available to them as well. We have some options. Uh, but if they have co-authors co at other schools, they may have op options that are available to them through those schools as well. But yeah, it's, uh, it's expensive. And some researchers do have grant funds that they can like write in these costs, but not everybody of course is supported by grants. Um, and often we have grad students who are not uh, supported in that way and are looking to, to be able to publish and start their, their research and scholarship uh, and are looking for funding. So we wanna be able to help them too. All right, any other questions? Yeah, okay, Leah, that's, uh, I'm glad that you brought that up too. That's a question that, that comes up sometimes if it's possible to wait. No, it's, uh, I think that's actually a good point. I'm glad for the reminder. Um, the worst that a publisher or editor can do if you ask to waive the APC is say no. Um, so you can ask and explain like, I'm an early career researcher, I'm a grad student, I'm in this kind of hardship situation, whatever the reasoning is, they don't have to say yes, they may say no, um, but it is possible that they could say yes. Uh, there, I think there are more, I hear more anecdotes about that, a positive outcome for that with um, research groups that are in underfunded nations. But I mean, I, I would not advise anyone to request a geographic hardship based on being in the US. Um, but there might be other types of hardships that a journal might um, be willing to work with you on that or potentially lower the APC. So it is worth asking.
Well, we appreciate the questions and the conversation around this stuff. I think it's really interesting. And I'm always, I, I'm definitely not an expert on any big deal stuff. So I'm glad to, to be reminded of the nuances in that conversation. Um, and always definitely glad to help authors try to find an option that will help them get their work published openly. And of course, there's always NC Docs. We didn't include it in this presentation, but if you're not able to find an OA option for publishing, you can likely still share your work openly through Green Open Access and NC Docs. And people are welcome to contact me and the rest of the NC Docs team for more information about that. Well, thanks to uh, Sam for facilitating today and thanks to everybody for being here. Um, and if questions come up in the future, just let us know. Thanks for coming. I dropped the link to the ULVLC Live Guide where recordings live um, as well as upcoming sessions. Pay attention to your email, particularly on Fridays for um, you know the upcoming ones the next week from Jenny. And uh, if you have any ideas for sessions, we're always looking. So if you were inspired by this and thought of another idea, let us know. Thanks, y'all. Have a good day. Bye.